So in this video, we're going to talk about PI3 kinase, uh, an enzyme that modifies PIP2, converts it to PIP3, which we covered in a previous video. And in this video, and in the next video, we're going to talk about PI3 kinase, how it's regulated, uh, what it's made of, and how it's mutated in many human cancers. So PI3 kinase is a very important enzyme to understand if you want to understand um, cell growth, cell division, cell survival, things like that. So let's talk about uh, what PA3 kinase is made of and how it is regulated. So um, PA3 kinase, there isn't just one PA3 kinase in the cell. There could be many different PA3 kinases. So there's class one, class two, class three, class four. There are PA3 kinase alpha, gamma, delta. And, you know, we're not going to get into all the different kinds because we're going to talk about the general function of PI3 kinase. Uh, if you want to go down that rabbit hole, you can see how they all are slightly different, but we're going to talk mostly about PI3 kinase, the class one version, which regulates um, cell growth and division and apoptosis that regulates the uh, AKT pathway. So if you see, you know, terms like alpha or gamma or delta, um, again, it's just PA3 kinase, um, but uh, there are differences between all of them. We're just going to talk about the general PA3 kinase class 1 version. So PA3 kinase we introduced in a previous video is a kinase that will phosphorylate PIP2, and add a phosphate to PIP2, and make it PIP3. Okay, what else do we need to know about um, PA3 kinase? Well, if you see PI3 kinase drawn, uh, sometimes it's just drawn as PI3K, or sometimes it'll have a little more detail. It'll be shown that it's made of actually two protein subunits. It's actually a heterodimer of two different proteins. So here I've drawn them out as P10. I'm sorry, no, not P10. That's completely different. P110 and P85. So P110 is a protein, and P85 is a different protein, and these proteins bind together in this... Uh, heterodimer makes up PI3 kinase. So the P110 subunit is the catalytic subunit and P85 is the called the regulatory subunit. So PI3 kinase is actually two different proteins that come together to make this enzyme. So it's got quaternary structure. So these uh, enzymes, let me move out of the way here, um, these subunits are made of um, made from genes, right? The genes must code for these proteins. So the P110 catalytic subunit is coded for by a gene called PIK3CA. And the reason I mention that is because we're going to see mutations in this gene. So the gene name is a little different than the subunit name, right? So PIK3CA, and there's different versions. There's A, there's B. We're... D, we're not going to get into them, um, <clears throat> but this version makes this catalytic subunit we're going to call P110. And then another gene, PIK3R1, so we got R1 for regulatory subunit, we got CA for the catalytic subunit. So PIK3R1 codes for the protein P85, which is a regulatory subunit of PI3 kinase. So again, we introduced this concept to show you that P3 kinase is actually not one single protein, but it's two proteins coming together in quaternary structure. What else do we need to know about P3 kinase? Well, these um, proteins have domains, and there are three important domains to talk about when we talk about uh, P3 kinase. So the P110 subunit, uh, if it's the catalytic domain, and right, this is a kinase, it must have the ATP binding pocket. And there it is, ATP binding pocket. So one of the domains in P110 is the pocket that binds ATP that remo can remove the phosphate and transfer it over to its substrate, PIP2. Um, there is a domain in the P85 protein called an SH2 domain. And I made a whole video on SH2 domains. So hopefully you recall what an SH2 domain binds, what its function is. Do you recall? An SH2 domain can bind phosphorylated tyrosines. Not every phosphorylated tyrosines, but phosphorylated tyrosines within its sort of uh, binding motif. So P85 binds certain phosphorylated tyrosines on proteins, and that will allow this uh, protein, P3 kinase, to be recruited to the plasma membrane we'll see shortly. One more domain to talk about 
is in the P110 um, subunit, and we'll call this RBD for RAS GTP binding domain. So if you recall, RAS is a very important signaling molecule, and RAS can exist in different forms. When RAS is bound to GTP, P110 can bind to it. So this is similar to another protein you learned about in a previous video, hopefully. Do you remember what video bind, what protein binds RAS GTP and activates when it binds? Yes, it is the kinase RAF. So now we have another protein that is similar to RAF that will bind RAS GTP. And again, that's covered in a previous video. So these are PA3 kinases two subunits, and these are the domains within the subunits. So it's important to understand these domains because we're going to talk about the, how the reg, how PA3 kinase is regulated. Okay, so here is a cell, and since we're focusing mostly on cancer, um, here's a cell that is in G1, a normal cell. And what do you find in a normal cell? Well, let's look at some receptor tyrosine kinases. They're not engaged with ligand, so they are monomers, and they are not phosphorylated typically on their tyrosine residues, on their intracellular tails. Um, we have RAS in this um, cartoon in the plasma membrane, uh, RAS bound with GDP, all right, and again, when cells are in G1, and you'll see that there are many PIP2 molecules in the plasma membrane, and that's what cells typically look like when they're in G1. And um, where is PI3 kinase? Well, it's in the cell, it's uh, in the cytoplasm, but it's not anywhere near its substrates, right? PI3 kinase um, it could be in the cytosol, it's not near the um, cytoplasmic side of the plasma membrane. So in cells that are in G1, PI3 uh, kinase is typically not active, it's not near its substrate, and it's not converting PIP2 to PIP3. So G cells in G1 typically have high levels of PIP2. So now let's see how we activate or regulate PI3 kinase. So here, we're going to switch to a cell that now has received a signal to, let's say, go through the cell cycle. If the cell is exposed to growth factors that bind growth factor receptors that trigger dimerization, kinase activation, and transphosphorylation of those receptor tyrosine kinases, then you would get phosphorylation of the tyrosines in the cytoplasmic tails of, let's say, VGF receptor family or PDGF receptors or FGF receptors. So this is one way to transmit a signal to PA3 kinase. So um, the other thing you'll notice in this uh, cartoon is now RAS is bound to GTP. We've covered in a previous video how um, and the, the, the protein SOS, which is the guanine nucleotide exchange factor, will actually swap out the GDP and put in GTP. So this is cells getting a signal to go through the cell cycle. And so now we're going to say how the signal is transmitted to PI3 kinase. So as I told you in the previous slide, P85 has an SH2 domain. So the SH2 domain is bind phosphorylated tyrosines. So PI3 kinase can either bind directly to phosphorylated tyrosines on the cytoplasmic tails of many uh, receptor tyrosine kinases, or they bind an adapter protein that also that binds those phosphorylated tyrosines. So P3 kinase can either bind directly or indirectly to the cytoplasmic tails of phosphorylated of the phosphorylated tyrosines in the cytoplasmic tails of receptor tyrosine kinases. And again, when if it binds indirectly, it's binding a protein with a phosphorylated tyrosine that binding the phosphorylated tyrosine on the uh, receptor tyrosine kinase. So there's an adapter protein. And we talked about that in a previous video, how adapter proteins can um, link SH2-containing proteins to receptor tyrosine kinase. Either way, what do we have here? Now we have PA3 kinase right next to the plasma membrane, right next to its substrate. So now that it is near its substrate, it will bind ATP, grab that terminal phosphate off, and attach it to PIP2, making PIP3. So receptor tyrosine kinases can activate PIP, uh, PIA3 kinase, and thus generating PIP3 in a cell. So that's one way that PIA3 kinase is regulated, either directly via um, the tyrosines that are phosphorylated 
on receptor targeting kinases, or could be through RAS GTP. So remember, P3, uh, P10, P110, I gotta get that straight because P10 is a completely different thing. P110 it has a domain, the RAS GTP binding domain. So when cells get a signal to grow or other signals that come into the cell can get transmitted to guanine nucleotide exchange factors, GEFs, and GEFs will exchange GDP for GTP, and now RAS is bound to GTP. When RAS is bound to GTP, that can allow PI3 kinase via that RAS GTP binding domain to bind RAS GTP. And now again, now where is PI3 kinase? It is near the plasma membrane, it is near its substrate, and what's it going to do? Phosphorylate its substrate and make PIP3. So these are two different ways that PI3 kinase can be regulated, either through the phosphorylation of tyrosines in receptor tyrosine kinases or RAS GTP. There are other ways to regulate PI3 kinase. These are just two of them, which are very important in cancer biology. Um, but again, this is a normal cell. So in a normal cell, um, when cells get the signal to grow, to go through the cell cycle, cells generate PIP3 by the ways that I just showed you. And now that cells have PIP3, they can um, transmit signals to AKT, which we'll get to in a later video, and cells will go through the cell cycle. Cells will also inhibit apoptosis. They'll be in a pro-survival state. Um, and this is all mediated by PIP3, which is again regulated by PI3 kinase. So um, I think I'm gonna stop the video there because what we're gonna talk about next is how PI3 kinase is misregulated in human cancers, and well as how drugs uh, that target PA3 kinase can be used to treat human cancer.